still praise you if you give me a Welcome to another Sunday service at the Lighthouse Digital Church. So glad you made it today and I'm so excited to take the recap from last Sunday. The message was titled, How to Pray the Solution and Not the Problem. A very important and timely message because we live in an era where people have so many dreams, goals, desires, aspirations, whatever you name it. And we are constantly wondering, trying to figure out how we're going to manifest that image we have in our minds concerning our future and bringing it to reality you know there is a way to do that and we do that through prayer but when praying we do not pray the problems we pray the solution how do we pray the problem now pastor davis gave an illustration last week during his message he said sometimes when you're praying for someone that is ill or maybe yourself you're trusting God for healing and then you start praying and you start mentioning words like death oh I will not die you know stuff like that and when you say words like death in that situation that someone is trusting God for healing you create a picture of death in that person's mind you could instead choose to say with long life Will God satisfy that person and show him his salvation? And the moment you say that, you create pictures of life in the person's mind. You create pictures of life in your own mind if you're the one trusting God for healing. Why is this so? It's because words paint pictures in our minds. And this is how God created the universe. The universe was created by the Word of God. The universe is still being held by the Word of God. The universe will still be recreated. You know, the new Jerusalem, the new earth, those will be recreated by the Word of God. So words are very, very powerful. Words are very important. And words can bring the kind of results that we want. Now, if solution is what you're after, you have to say words that will bring those solutions you're looking for and every solution that you seek as a child of God is actually in his word so when trying to pray solutions you go back to the word of God and seek for the answer over that thing you're looking for and it will always become a reality because God's words are powerful God's words produce results if you want to manifest your future you have to pray solutions you do not pray problems you pray life you speak what you want to see don't put your energy in what you don't want to see because that's going to paint a picture in your mind what you want to do is paint pictures that you actually want to see in your reality i hope that we stay with this point i hope that we stay with this message until we begin to manifest the kind of future that we want to see I hope that we enter the main service with an open mind as we continue this series of manifesting our future. Bye. Heavenly Father, we give you praise. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the opportunity to come again into your presence and share the immutable word of God that can save lives. Thank you almighty God that your word is powerful your word is as powerful as you are therefore this morning almighty God has come to listen and hear the word of God we know that you are here we know that your presence is here we know almighty God that we will not live here the same way that we have come 
we know almighty god according to your word that no one encounters the presence of god and lives the same way that they have come in the name of jesus we thank you for what you will do this morning i submit my vocal cords into your hands use these vocal cords to communicate these words to your people these words in season to your people that every heart that listens we open up to see and hear and believe what you are speaking this morning in the name of Jesus help us to live here to be doers of the word and not just hearers only Lord we thank you we give free reign this morning to the wonderful Holy Spirit in our homes on the way or whatever it is that we may be connecting to church this morning may the spirit of god hover and brood over that which we hear in the name of jesus thank you heavenly father in jesus name we pray amen good morning good morning and then welcome to church today we go continue to further our conversation about how to manifest your future if you remember last week i said there are four steps this is what God showed me on how to manifest the future. Number one, believe that God is your unlimited source of supply, that God wants the best for you, what God wants you to prosper. Number two, make sure that what you are imagining aligns with what you want. Make sure that you allow your heart to paint the picture of the future that you want. Number three, let your mouth to do the talking, to speak what God says in that situation speak like god will speak say what god says in the situation you find yourself so as it pertains to your future begin to speak about what god has said about it i'm blessed and righteous things are working for me and number four is to act like god would act okay all right so that but number three which is about speaking about god will speak we started talking about prayers you know not just uh, the words you speak but how to pray that's what I spoke on last week. Last week I spoke about learning to pray the solution, not a problem. Learning to pray the solution, not a problem. You know. So today I'm going to be talking about the power of your confession. How to manifest your future by the power of your co- confession. So a lot of times when we're in prayers, we spend a lot of time at times speaking about a problem. Like God didn't know about them. You know, if you find yourself in a pickle at this point in time, um, there's no use in talking about the pickle because God already knows you are in a pickle and God God wants to get you out of that pickle, right? So what God expects us to do is to say what we want in the place of prayer. Now, let me show you where I got that from. You know, in the book of Mark chapter 11, verse 24, in the KJV, the Bible says, Therefore I say unto you, this is Jesus Christ speaking, say, Therefore, I say unto you, what so what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now I told you before that when you see and when you see it uh, some words italized in the Bible, those words were not there in the original language. It was placed there to make sense because at times when they translated the words they don't make sense. So they just put those words there to um, to make to make the words make sense. If you go back to this text and read it again without those words italized, what you will get is what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have. Whatsoever thing you desire when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have. So let's 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 ponder on that for a moment. What things soever, whatever thing you do, what you desire. Whatever thing you desire, what do you do? When you pray. Not if you pray. When you pray what? When you pray what you desire. Then what will happen? Believe that you receive. Receive what? What you desire. And you shall have what? What you desire. So, this test essentially is saying, what you desire is what you pray about. So, what you desire, which is a solution you want, is what you pray about. You don't pray the problems. You don't keep talking about the problems in the place of prayers. God knows about the problems before the problems show up in your life. 
but he said you pray your desire so if i'm sick what will i say because my desire is to be healed i will do what i will pray for healing if i'm broke what do i desire when i'm broke i want abundance so what am i going to pray i will pray for abundance why is this important we are praying what we want we are not praying what we have this principle is the way god does things this is not my principle this is the principle of god in first corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 to 28 the bible says for you see your calling brethren that not many wise according to the flesh not many mighty not many noble are called but god has chosen god has chosen god has chosen what the foolish things of the world to put the sh- to shame the wise and god has chosen god has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty essentially he's saying the things that god chose to manifest his power on the earth contradict what the world system which is god has a way of choosing things that the world will not choose what the world system commonizes is what exactly what god uses to bring forth his glory why is that so that nobody can boast in the presence of god nobody can say it's because i went to oxford or i went to mit that's why i came top in my class or that's why like my life is going on well god can even take somebody who didn't go to school you know and make them to prosper this is what i mean god chooses the weak things of this world you know to what to put to shame things are mighty but verse 28 is where i'm going and the base things of the world the things which are despised god has chosen if there's something that is despised that same thing that is despised god is able to use that despised things to bring glory to his name and then and the things which are not the things which do not exist god uses the things which are not things which do not things which do not exist god uses these things to bring to nothing the things that are which means god uses the things that you cannot see the things that are invisible to bring to nothing the things that are visible the things which are not god uses to bring to nothing the things that are another way to look at this principle is in romans chapter 4 verse 17. again we covered this last week i'm just repeating that so that it sinks in the bible says as it is written in scripture i'm reading the amplified version i have made you a father of many nations god was talking to abraham at this point in time abraham did not have a child but god says i have made you not i am going to make you god said i have made you he has made him the father of many nations when he was still yet without a child god said i made you it has already been done in the reckoning of god it is as good as done because i have made you a father of many nations and then in the sight of this god in whom abraham believed the bible says abraham believed the god who said i have made you a father of many nations when abraham did not even have a child even abraham did not have any physical evidence to the contrary any any physical evidence that suggested that he already has many children as a matter of fact he had no child in the time when he had no child was when god was saying i have made you so god essentially began to call forth what he wanted before those things manifested the bible says this same god is the one that god believed but which god is this go back to the text the god who gives life to the dead and the god who calls into being that things which do not exist so the bible here says that when something is dead what does god do god gives life to it god gives life to something that is dead physically it is dead but god gives life to that thing which is dead that things which those things which do not exist what does god do god calls them into existence so god speaks them into existence but say god calls those things that be not as though they were god calls that do not exist he calls them into existence how does he do them he does this by the word of faith the bible says book of hebrews i believe chapter 11 verse 3 by faith we believed by faith we believe by faith we know that the world this uh, earth was framed that word framed was the word katatizo which means to set in place the words were framed by the word of god 
the words, the words, the word system, everything that you see in the world here, were set in place, were set in how they ought to be, how they manifested, how you see them today by the spoken word of God. So God calls those things that be not as though they were. When God was saying, let the earth bring sprout forth vegetation. The earth, when you, if you were with God, in the book of Genesis, when he said the earth should bring forth vegetation, if you were with God, you will see a barren land where there was nothing in it. But God spoke to the barren land that physically, in physical reality, there was nothing on it and nothing in it. God says to it to bring forth out of itself vegetation. The same thing when God spoke to the ocean. If you were looking at the ocean, if you were with God in the beginning of creation and you were, to, to, you were with him in the sub, 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 subterranean sub, 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 sea and you were there with him in, in the belly of the ocean, you will not see any creature. You just see a, a mass volume of water. But in the middle of that mass volume of water, God calls for what? The fish that you saw, the whales, and all the, all the living creatures that are in the sea. Essentially, the sea gave birth to the fish, to the fishes and, 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 the, and the whales and stuff. The sea gave birth to that. The sea gave back to, to your octopus. The sea gave birth to, uh, to animal. The sea gave back to these things that you can see now. The earth gave back to your oak tree. The earth gave back to your uh, banana tree. The, the, the earth gave back to this thing. The earth produced them. But when you, if you were with God in the beginning of creation and you were there with him, you will not see anything. You will not see anything. You will see barrenness. But in the midst of barrenness, in the midst of what looks like nothing is ever going to happen, God calls for the things which he wanted. This is the principle that God used. This is the principle in which God spoke those things into existence that do not yet exist. So the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, therefore verse 3, that by faith we believe that the word was framed, the word system, everything you see were catatizod by the word of God. So now that we know that God caused those things that be not as though they were, how can we use this same principle to call forth into our own lives the things that we don't have so that they can manifest? Before I answer that question, I want to show you an example in the lives of Jesus. Remember, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is and was and will always be our role model. We have no business modeling, making anybody else on this earth our role model. We can appreciate people, we can uh, appreciate men of God or whoever, but God, Jesus, has to be our role model. If he did it, we can do it. He said in the book of John chapter 14, I believe, greater things than this you will do. Greater things than what I have done, you will do. So he's expecting us to follow in his footsteps. So let's look at a number of examples. I think I'm going to go through about five examples today to show you in the life of Jesus how he called those things that be not as though they were. All right. And then on the back of that, I will then begin to talk about how you can do the same thing by the power of your words. Let's go. The first example we're going to look is the book of Luke, Luke chapter 13, verse 11 to 13. In this text, the Lord Jesus Christ called somebody that was bound or afflicted or bent over. Was it was called loosed. Let's look at that. 11 says, And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years and was bowed down and could in no way lift herself up. This woman was crouched over. She was bent like this. She couldn't lift herself up. She couldn't walk straight. She couldn't walk uprightly. All right. Now, when Jesus saw her, he called to her. And said to her, Woman, thou art loosed from thy infirmity. And he said, and, and he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now, let's back up. This woman, before Jesus Christ laid his hands on her, what did he do first? He declared what he wanted her to become before he laid his hands on, on her. Verse 12 says, He called her to himself. And then he said to her, it spoke the word of faith, woman, you are loose from this infirmity. You are loose from your infirmity. God declared her loosed, even though she was bound. When the words came out of the mouth of Jesus, she was still, she was still bound. She was still bound. So did Jesus Christ lie? No. He, had, he set in motion what he wanted. Then he now laid his hands on her and then she was made straight. 
I hope that that makes sense. So in essence, Jesus Christ called for what he wanted before the thing manifested. I want you to say, I want to say this again. I'm probably going to say this over and over. You set the direction of your life with your own mouth. Your mouth is used as the goal setter. Your mouth sets the goal for what you want. You desire a thing, you pray about it. Desire comes to your heart. I would like to have this. You pray about it. You use your own mouth to set it in motion. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. Jesus Christ said, For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now, this text, Matthew 12, 37, I've preached about it before, but I'm going to repeat what I said. Matthew 12, 37, there are two words I want to call out. The first word is the word justified, and the second word is the word condemned. You see, the word justified in the Greek language is the word that means to render righteous or such as he ought to be, to render someone righteous or as someone ought to be. Okay, the word condemned means to give judgments against one. So if you take these two words and apply them back into this Matthew 12, 37, it will read like this, by your own words, you will be rendered as you ought to be. And by your own words, you will give judgment against yourself. Very important. This sentence here, this word I've just described here, lies the power of your own confession or, or your own words or your own life. So when I talk about the power of confession, it's coming from here. By your own words, you will set your life as it ought to be. By your own words, you will put yourself in judgment. You will judge against yourself. Okay. So when we talk about this, what essentially you should go away with this is that you set the direction of your life by the words coming out of your own mouth. The Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Book of Proverbs, death and life. Death and life are in the power, the power of your own tongue. Those that love to speak, we eat the food of what they speak, whether it is life or death, which means if you constantly speak death, you will eat the fruit of death. If you constantly speak life, you will eat the fruit of life. So I say to you, don't ever be flippant with words. Jesus Christ never was flippant with words. So you should never be flippant with words. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, Love has been perfected among us in this way, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So you see, notice that as he is, so are you in this world. I got a question for you. Today, where is Jesus? He's seated at the right hand of God in heaven. How is he today? Is he speaking gibberish out of his mouth? Is he speaking sickness out of his mouth? Is he speaking lack out of his mouth? You will never find these words, these languages, this vocabulary coming out of the mouth of Jesus. So if you are saying, you are claiming First John chapter 4, verse 17, and you say, oh, as he is, so am I in this world? As he is, so am I in this world? Then you better watch what you say. You better watch what you are saying out of your mouth. You better make sure that you are speaking words that Jesus Christ will speak at any point in time. Because if he is indeed, if you are indeed as he is in this world, then you ought to ensure that no negative words, no words of anxiety, no words of fear should have a place in your mouth. Praise God. Let's look at another thing, another example. Jesus Christ called for peace in the middle of the storm. You know, God has not promised us in this life that we will not face challenges or that we will not face tribulation or that problems will not come. He has never promised us. But he said to us, in this life, you will have, not you may have, you will have tribulation. But he said, but be of good cheer. Cheer up in the middle of that tribulation. Why? Because I have overcome the world. As another translation, I think the Amplified Version says, I have denied the world the power to hurt you. In the middle of the storm, God says, cheer up. That is contradictory. The word we say in the middle of tribulation, in the middle of challenges, run around and put on ashes on your head and wear long faces and let the world know things are falling apart. But that is not the approach of God. The approach of God is to cheer up. Why are you cheering up? Because victory is already being predetermined in your favor. Victory in that situation has been predetermined in your favor. It might take two years, it might take three years, but victory is assured. What do you need to do? 
say what God says. So let's look at this example. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. The Bible says, On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they woke and, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. He said to the storm, What? Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How is it that you have no faith? Faith in what? Faith in your own words. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and sea obey him? Now, before I start explaining this, I want to say something to you categorically here. Everything in your house, everything in your office, the car you drive, everything in, in, around you has ears to hear. Yes. How do I know that? Let me give you an example. When God spoke to the earth and said, let the earth bring forth vegetation, what was God speaking to? He was speaking to the ground. So the ground, when the ground brought forth that vegetation in response to the words that God spoke, the earth told us by that action that it heard the commands of the Lord. When God told the ocean, bring forth fish and large whales and sea animals, and the ocean responded by creating those things, it means the ocean can hear the voice of the Lord. If you are a child of God and you want to act like God will act, you will speak to things in your life. You will speak to your checkbooks, you will speak to your car, you will speak to your house, you will speak to your children, you speak to the ground on which you walk, you will speak to your job. What will you speak? You will say what you want. You will act like God will act and say what you want. So here, he's saying you, they have no faith when they are speaking the words of the enemy. What was the words of the enemy they were speaking? Verse 40 said, uh, verse um Verse 38 said, They said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They started to say, Look, when we look at this windstorm, we are going to die. They began to say out of their mouths that they are going to die. Ah, we are going to die. Oh, we are dying here. That is what they are saying. And just like I said, those words that they have said is a words of fear, is a words of faithlessness he said here why are you so fearful verse 40 why is it that you have no faith you know he didn't commend them and say oh man you did a very good job it's okay for you to say it say it like it is say that you are going to die it's okay to say that you know he said he didn't say that he said no why are you fearful why are you allowing fear to read your heart why are you talking as somebody who has no faith and you might be here today, you might be saying, Oh, David, I don't have faith. No, that's a lie. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, God has dealt to each one of us the same measure of faith. In fact, it is not possible for you to become born again without faith. Why? Ephesians chapter 2, I believe verse 8 says, For by grace you are saved. For by grace, for by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. So that scripture, you could say, for by grace you are saved through faith. And even that faith is not yours. It is a gift of God. So Romans 12, 3 says you have the same faith, the same measure of faith like everybody else. Right? You know, um, uh, you know the Bible, Ephesians 2, verse 8 says you are saved through that faith. That same simple, small faith, which is God's gift to you that made you to, say, to be saved. You are given the gift of faith. That made you to believe in this in the gospel and you became saved that same faith will never left you all right god gave you that same measure of faith like everybody else the bible actually says one of the scriptures that says we have the same precious faith like that of the apostles so you have faith and god said if you have faith as small as a mustard seed 
you will say unto this mulberry tree, be removed and be cast into the sea. So essentially, you, the faith you need is a small seed faith. So let's assume that you have this mustard seed faith because you do have that faith. Actually, you have the faith of God because God has to give you his faith in order for you to believe to become saved. And that faith never left you. So you have this small faith. So here he's telling them, how come you have no faith? These people have no faith because what? They're not even born again. These people are not born again here. These disciples are not born again. They're disciples of Jesus Christ, but they're not born again because nobody became born again until after Christ was raised from the dead. So when we say words that focuses, when we say words that focus on what we are experiencing, we are already walking in fear. But when we say words that contradict what we are experiencing, but based on the word of God, we are walking in faith. And when you walk in faith, faith will produce result for you in the name of Jesus. Praise God. So when Jesus Christ said, peace be still to the wind, before he said it, the wind was boisterous. When he said it, the sea became calm. So he, he declared what he wanted on the, on the wind before he saw the result. He said, peace be still. Instead of saying, wind is more, wind is more, wind is going to kill us, wind is going to, wind is going to kill us, we are going to sing, we are going to sing. Jesus Christ did not say that. He didn't say, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, make, he didn't magnify the storm by giving voice to it and saying this is going to kill us this is going to take us over no he magnified the word that he wanted he said peace be still to the storm and the storm was still, still was still so it would be stupid to keep saying big waves big winds we will sing we will sing when what you want is what peace so say what you want jesus christ said the goal of what he wanted by declaring it he said it first before he manifested it. Let's look at another example. Jesus Christ called the lepers. He called them clean. He called them clean before they were clean. Luke chapter 7, 17, verses 11 to 14. The Bible says, Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him there ten men who were lepers who stood far off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. And, as he, and so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. Now, this is an interesting one. It's an interesting one. You see here, under the Old Covenant, if you're a leper, you are not, not allowed to fraternize with the general populace. Lepers are ostracized from the society because it, it was a highly contagious disease. So this was when they saw Jesus Christ from afar off. They, began, they, they, they didn't want to come near to him. They saw him from afar and said, Master, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus Christ here did not have to lay hands on them. Right? Now, it's not he could have laid hands on them because he has laid hands on other people before that the, that the law says will make him to be defiled. He didn't, he didn't care about that. So he didn't lay hands on them here. Not because he doesn't want to lay hands on them. They were far off. They said, have mercy on you. So he just sent the same word. The same word that created the universe. He just said the word to them. Go and show yourself to the priest. Now, under the old covenant, lepers do not fraternize, like I said before. And if a leper gets cleansed or gets healed, that leper had to take himself or herself to show to the priest and then bring, and also bring an offering that says, oh, look, I used to be leprous but now i'm healed thank god for me you know, just bring an offering so the priest would look at the leper check the leper from the crown from the from the crown of the leper's head to the toe and certify that this is no longer a leper this person is healed so when Jesus Christ said to them go and show yourself to the priest essentially saying to them you are healed go and show yourself to the priest that's the implication of what he said you are already healed go and show yourself to the priest take an action of faith Go and show yourself to the priest that you are already healed. But when he said it, were they healed? No, they were not healed when he declared it. They were not, they, they were still leprous when he said it. But it was when they started to act on what he said that the, the healing manifested. Again, Jesus Christ declared what he wanted. He, he declared them cleaned before they showed up clean. I hope that is making sense. Okay, so Jesus Christ set in motion what he wanted to manifest by calling it first. 
he literally declared these people clean by asking them to act like they were clean before they became clean so at times you know uh possibly we're going to do that in one of our session let's say there's a let's say there's a let's say well there's a thing called act as if is yes, that's probably one of the best i'm going to preach soon act as if i think it's part of this manifesting your, your future act as if essentially means you don't have it yet but begin to act like you are why because when you begin to act like you have received it even though you have not yet received it you are sending a wave a, a, a subconscious wave into your mind that says you are living in the reality of your faith you are not living in the reality of your physical senses so acting as if i'm healed you know accelerates my healing acting as if i'm prosperous accelerates my prosperity because i am already operating by my actions at the frequency of where i am going to that's what is, is happening so here as they acted in the based on what christ said the healing manifested praise god let's look at another one just has called the infirmed to to be as whole in john chapter 5 verses 5 to 8 the bible says now a certain man was there who had infirmity 38 years when just christ saw him lying there when christ saw him lying there i knew that he had already been there in that condition a long time he said to him to him do you want to be made well the sick man answered him and said sir i have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up but while i'm coming another steps down before me jesus christ said to him rise take up your bed and walk and immediately the man was made well took up his bed and walked and that day was a sabbath now here's a here's a question this man was already you know was already lying there he didn't have any help now there's another, another story here where this man was again speaking the vocabulary of death when christ asked him do you want to be made well should his answer not have been yes i want to be made well that's what he should have said but this man started talking about the problems this is a classic example of how not to pray the problem but to pray the solution this man in verse 7 was praying the problem he was recounting the problem to jesus jesus christ knew what the problem was he already saw him in that condition he already knew that he was in that condition for a long time the same way whatever you are going through right now jesus christ already knew what you were going through he knew how long you have been in there but he's asked me to tell you will you change your vocabulary will you start to pray the solution will you start to say what you want not tell me not come into place of prayer and recount all the troubles you're going through oh lord you know my husband is a, is a disaster waiting to happen oh you know my husband is always a is a is 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 a is a bad person you know look at the way he did he tell me the other day oh lord won't you avenge me you are praying the problem you are praying the problem you need to pray what you want your husband to be lord i think that my husband is a great guy he's getting better he's getting better his, his character is improving in the name of jesus christ you pray what you want not pray the problem this man here started to pray the problem oh lord you know what ah man i have so much problem you know when the water is stirred up there's no one to carry me i'm so helpless i have no help from anyone you know because of this you know what other people just chance me this is how life has happened to me i was born on the right side of the track i was born into the wrong family i was born into the wrong country oh look at me because i mean i, I have this color of my skin nothing is ever working for me oh because i'm this tall or i'm this short i'm this fat i'm this thin nothing ever works for me because of this and that and that excuses 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 when you begin to, when you spend your entire life recounting those excuses why things are not working for you, you say it over and over and over you are doing what you are magnifying that problem you are magnifying the challenges that you are going through and as you give voice to the things you magnify it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger no now you're wondering how come nothing is working because you have spent 15 years saying the same problem talking about the same problem over and over and over again it's not going to go like that you got to learn to speak the way god speaks you got to learn to speak how god does his own thing you have to learn to pray the solution so here just christ said to him just christ cut that conversation short and said listen rise up take up your bed and walk i don't i'm not here to listen to excuses i'm not here to listen to the things that are not working in your life i'm here to bring solutions so rise up take your bed your bed and walk so he declared him to walk when he was still what a paralytic when he was still lying on the bed he declared the end he said what he wanted and the moment he said it the guy did what pick up picked up his bed and walked so christ spoke what he wanted over him before it manifested in his life okay let's look at another example jesus christ called a sinner forgiven 
and a paralytic whole. This is what he did. Luke chapter 5, verse 17 to 26. The Bible says, Now it happened on a certain day. As he was teaching, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law, right? Sitting by, sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Listen to this. The power of the Lord was present to heal. The power of the Lord is always present to heal. Under the new covenant, the power doesn't come and go. Why? Because the power lives inside of you. The power is always present to heal them. Now, the same power that is present to heal them is also present to deliver them. It's also present to make them prosperous. This power is not just for healing alone. This power that you carry, the Bible says, we have this power in even vessels. We have this power in heathen vessels so that the glory will not be of us but will be of God. Essentially, he's talking about the Father. The power that causes miracle to happen in your life is carried in heathen vessels, is carried in your body, is in your body. God has put that power right there in your spirit. Your spirit carries the Holy Spirit, carries the power of God. We have this power in hidden vessels so that the excellency of it or the glory of it might not be of us but might be of God. So you have this power. This power is available to heal, to deliver, to set free. This power is available to cause salvation to happen in your life at every single moment. I want you to understand that. Listen. When Christ came, he came under the old covenant to usher in the new covenant. You have to understand that Christ was the bridge between the old and the new covenant. So he came under the law to deliver them that were under the law so that they can inherit the promise. That's what the Bible teaches. He came under the law, functioned under the law, usher in the new covenant so that those who are under can be delivered and act in so here, when the Bible says the power of God was present to heal, you need to understand it that now that you, the power of God is always present in your life to heal you. The other day, God was telling me something. God said to me, my power to manifest, my power to heal, to deliver at every point in time is always available. It is up to us now to tap into that frequency, to, 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 to embrace that frequency. How? By the words that we speak. So, verse 18 says, Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him, bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the, 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 uh, the tailing uh, into, into the midst of Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. So here you see, faith is an active word. When you have faith, you act in faith. Again, I'm going to come back to this text in, a, in another preaching when I talk about acting as if. So I'm going to skip this one for now. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus Christ perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your heart? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk. Now, look at verse 24. Beautiful. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, I say to you, he was still paralyzed when he, when he was going to say this, I say to you, take a up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Verse 26, and, when they, and they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. So if you look at verse 20 and verse 24, Jesus Christ declared this guy to be sinless, to, to be forgiven of sin when he was still a sinner. There was nothing here that says he said the, he said the Lord's prayer or he said the prayer of salvation. No, he just said, your sins are forgiven you. He declared him forgiven of sins when he was still a sinner. He called those things that he wanted before those things manifested. Then, when he came to healing, he said to him, while he was still on that bed, he said what he wanted. He said the direction of what he wanted. He said, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Again, this is the principle. It's an, it's an unfailing. This principle I'm teaching here is an unfailing principle that we always work because this is the way God himself manifested everything you see here. He said them. He spoke them. How? By faith. He spoke them by faith. Let's look at the last example. Jesus Christ called the wretched hands to stretch. He called the wretched, wretched hands. Wretched hands. 
when the wretched hands were spoken to, when the wretched hands were spoken to, they were withered. They were withered. But he said, stretch, stretch, stretch. He spoke by faith and the withered hands responded to the voice of, the, of God. Everything in the universe responds to word. Everything in the universe responds to word. You know, if you, if you don't get anything from this message, I'm begging you, get this. Everything in your house, from the book you read, from the TV you watch, the car you drive, the ground on which you walk, the clothes you wear, everything responds to the word of God. Why? Because by faith we believe that the word was framed, was catatizoed by the word of God. Everything responds to the word of God. Everything in the universe responds to the word of God. Why? Because everything can hear. Everything you see in this world has ears that can hear. So what are you going to be over situations in your life? Because everything responds to the word of God. So here, he said to the withered hands, stretch and the withered hands. Luke chapter 6, verse 6 to 11. Now it happened on another Sabbath also that he entered the synagogue and taught, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thought, and said to the man who had withered hand, Arise, stand here. And he stood up, and he rose and stood. Verse 9. The just guy said to them, I will ask you one thing Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil or to save life or to destroy? And when he had looked around at them, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He said to the man <laughs> who had withered hands, stretch your hands. He didn't say, with a hand, with a hand, stay there. No, he said what he wanted. Stretch your hands. And he did so. And his hands was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed one, 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 with one another what they might do to Jesus. Jesus Christ said to a withered hand to stretch. The hands was withered. He said, stretch. So, in the, in, the, in the words, stretch out your hand. In the words, stretch out your hand. In that sentence, is loaded with power to cause the nerve, the nerves, the muscles and the tendons of the hand that have been withered to be rejuvenated and come alive and receive strength so that they can stretch forth like this. This is God's method of calling those things that be not as though they were. When he calls them, they become. Whatever God calls them, they become. When God says, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish your health, that is what he has declared over you. And that is who you are. Now, you may not believe it. You may not appreciate it. You may not accept it. But that is who you are. God calls those things that be not as though they were. So, Jesus Christ followed this method. Our role model followed this method while he was on the earth. It's a confession of faith. It's a declaration of possibilities. It's setting the goal of what is desired. How do you set this goal? By the spoken word. By faith, we believe the word was framed by the word of God. I know I've used this scripture over and over today, but I want you to understand it. By faith, we believe that the word was framed by the word of God. So when God wants to frame something, he had to speak it. This is God's way of doing things. God never did anything on the earth that he has not spoken. Think about the birth of Jesus. From the Garden of, from the garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3 to the book of Luke chapter 1 when the, when the, when the, uh, when Angel Gabriel came to talk to, 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 to Mary, God said those things he was going to do before they happened. Go back and read it. The birth of Jesus Christ was prophesied from the Garden in Genesis up until the, when Luke and when Gabriel came up to show, talk to Mary, the words were kept, kept on saying, and a virgin shall give birth to a child. And the seed of the woman will bruise the head of Satan. Those were words. God was setting his agenda in motion, what he was going to do. So, Matthew 12, 37 says, by your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. So, it is your word, by your word that you render your life as you ought to be. By your own words, you will give judgment against your life. So, what do you want to confess over your life? Before we talk about that, 
Let's talk about the meaning of confession. Confession by definition means to say the same thing as, to say the same thing, to say the same thing. We have taken confession to mean talking about yourself as a sinner. Oh, I'm a sinner. Confess your sin. Confess your sin. I'm a sinner. We take confession that means say the same thing as, and we don't need to focus, solely focus on what? On confession of sins. We have lost sight of what? Confession of confessing the word of God, saying what God says about us all over our own lives. So confession is what God has said. is about saying what God says. Let me give you an example of what God has said, God has said over your life. In Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 13, God says you are the head and not the tail. So what do you confess? You will say, I am the head and not the tail. Why is that? Job 22, 27 to 28, I read this last week, says, you will make your prayer to him and he will answer you. You will pay your vows. You shall decide and decree. You will decide what you want. Again, remember, desire, desire, desire. When you, de- when, when you pray, whatever you desire, when you pray, believe you have, and you shall, be, believe you have received, and then you shall have. Remember, we spoke about that in Mark, Mark, 11, uh, uh, verse, Mark 11, verse 23, you know, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe you have received them, and then you are going to have them. Okay, you shall decide and decree. So, what you decide is your desire. Job 22, 27, 28 here, I'm reading. What you desire, which is was shown to us in the book of Mark 11, what you desire is, your, is what you have decided that you want. Therefore, what do you do to that thing? You pray about it. How do you pray? You decree it. You decree a thing. And what will happen? It will be established for you. And when it is established for you, it means it makes it's made manifest for you. But when you desire that which you desire, you don't yet have it. But what do you go to, does, did God say you should do? He said you should decree it. You, should, you declare what you want in the place of prayer. Then it will be for you. And then when it's manifested for you, light will shine upon your ways. So this place, this scripture places serious emphasis on what you say out of your mouth in the place of prayer. So God will not do the confession for you. You will do the confession for yourself. It's up to you to confess about your life what God has said. Don't say what God has not said. Don't side with the devil. How do you side with the devil? When you speak words of death, words of negativity out of your own mouth. Let me give you some example. So, so, so for suppose your friend meets you and say, what's up buddy, how you doing? You say, I'm just hanging in there. We are just managing. You know what you just said? You have said, you have said, I am barely surviving. This statement, I am just hanging in there. I'm just managing. We set your life perpetually at what? In man, manage, manage mode. That's the direction you are set because that's what you will keep saying to yourself. This may be your current reality, but that's not what you want, right? That's not what you desire, right? You don't want to be hanging in there or be managing, do you? No. So, because that's not what you want, what do you want? You want to be on top. You want to be an overcomer. You want to live a life where you are ruling in this life, right? So what do you do? You pray that desire. You change that conversation. How will you change it? You can say, my life is beautiful and I reign in life by Christ Jesus. Now, let me give you a warning here. When you start to say this, because it's not physically true in your life, your mind will wage war against you that you are lying. But you are not. You know what you are doing? You are setting the goal of what you want by calling those things that be not as though they were in in essence you are acting like when you persist in this way when you keep saying what god says in light of contradictions you you know what you are doing you are rewiring your mind for success yesterday in in prayer meeting at in the morning uh, you might find the video as well on youtube uh, on youtube if my if my um, uh, team have put in there uh, it's called um um program your mind for success we have some prophetic uh, affirmation in the morning where i try to explain this thing as well you know you can go to youtube channel youtube channel and find it in there you find it there under uh, some affirmation or whatever you find it in there it's a prayer that we prayed but what i did there was i was saying when you persist in saying what god says or what you want what you are doing really you are rem- you you are wiring rewiring your mind for success in the beginning you know because it's not true in your life yet your mind may, may wage war against you just stay there persist there you will so um let me give you another example you will not lose your job that's a wrong prayer that's a wrong prayer that's a wrong confession why is focusing on you losing your job even though you don't know it you know what you should say you should say 
you will always be gainfully employed. What picture? What picture is that painting in your mind? Picture of what you want, not what you have. I've I've got it, a small table here where I've put wrong confession that is based on fear and right confession that is based on faith. If you want a copy of it, just write to the church office. It's just, it's just an example that I just made up so to help you to see the impact of what I'm saying on how powerful your confession is. Let's look at some, some of them. Nothing ever works in my life. I might start next, next week's uh, meeting and uh, uh, teaching from this place anyway to go over each one of these I'll go over each, each one of these and explain it in detail because I think I'm running out of time. You know? So, for example, somebody says, nothing ever works in my life. You should say, I succeed in everything that I do. You could, somebody might always say, I'm so disorganized, I'm clumsy. What are you saying? You are saying to yourself, you are clumsy, you are disorganized. But that's not the right confession. Right confession will be, my mind is organized and my nervous system functions well. Somebody might say to you, I pray against any accident on the way. What are you what they focusing on? Accident on the way. What should you say? I get to my destination safely in the name of Jesus. You might say, we don't know how things will pan out. Maybe you are going through challenges. Oh, I, mean, I don't know how this is going to work. No, you are setting in motion. Say, I don't know how this is going to go. But that's not your confession. Your question should be what? Everything is working out in my favor. For example, you might say, there's no job in the market. Things are going down. That's not your confession. But that's not what you want. What? I'm gainfully employed. Somebody might be around you or you might have been saying, I don't have enough money to meet all this need. That is a wrong confession. You should say, the Lord supplies my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You might say, oh man, these children are killing me or they're going to kill me one day. That is a wrong statement. That's a wrong confession because you don't want your children to kill you. What do you want? You want your children to live to an old age, to be around you when it is your time for you to pass on from this life. So what you say? God gives beautiful children and my children are blessings from the Lord. You might say, my spouse is so wasteful and unresourceful. You set that word in motion. Your spouse constantly becomes wasteful and unresourceful. You might say, but that's how it has, it has always been. Yes, I know that's how it has, it has always been. But that's not what you want, is it? No. So what do you say? You say what a blessing God has made my spouse. He or she is resourceful and advanced and he advances or he or she advances in life. Do you see what I'm saying here? Let me give you three more. All right. The recession is wiping off every business around me and I'm afraid my business may not survive it. That is a wrong confession because what you're already afraid. You're already afraid you will not survive it. You are focusing on losing your business. That is not the right confession. What should you say? I operate under perpetual open heavens. My business has its source in God. Therefore, in every season, we will always prosper. Look at the difference between the prayers. All right. Look at another one. This knee is killing me. Wow. The knee is paining you truly. It's paining you. It's paining you all the time. But if you say it's killing you, now you're saying this knee is going to kill me one day. That's not what you want, is it? What should you say? I have healthy and strong bones. Hallelujah. Last point I've got here is, you might say, I'm sick and tired of this place. Maybe you're in a crampy place. You don't like the place. You don't like the accommodation where you're living in. Say, I'm sick and tired of this place. Where you're already saying you are sick, you're calling sickness on your body, and you're calling being tired on your body. What should you say? That's not what you want, right? You say, I will change where I live to a better place. Better days are ahead for me. I hope you understand the enormity of what I share with you this morning. I know I've taken a lot, a lot of your time, but this script, this message is worthy of you watching it, listening to it over and over again. Now, once you understand how these things work, the power of your words, you know what you do? You start correcting yourself. If you find yourself speak some word that you don't like, call it back. I called my cousin, cousin early in the morning yesterday, and she, when you, I said, "How are you?" So I'm, or as she said, "I'm hanging in there." Or she said some word. I said, "That's not the right confession." And she got it. She, Immediately, it. Why? Because at times these words we speak, we have said them so many times in our lives, we don't know they are negative words. Those words program our own minds for failure. So I'm asking you to get that uh, video on YouTube on programming your mind for success. Listen to the prayer point. I think I, I don't know how many prayer points I called. We didn't finish. We spent an hour doing it. Just listen to it as many times you can listen to it. It will really help you. All right. So now that you know that you can set your own life in order by the words of your mouth, what are you going to say or confess today? What are you going to say or confess today? What do you want to say or confess today? I'm going to stop here. I'm going to start next week. Next week, I'm going to be talking about seven reasons why confessions work. 
seven reasons why confessions work. I will start telling you about confession again. I will talk about why you need to believe your confession when you say them. I will also explain to you that even if you don't believe your confession in the beginning, how confession by its nature, when you start to say them, is actually programming your own mind for you to believe what you are saying. After a while, if you say it over a, a long period of time, you start to believe what you say. And if you have to believe what you say, you are going to begin to get what you want. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want to also let you know that um, beginning of October, beginning of October, the Lord is placed on my heart to do a 30-day challenge. It's called Confess to Possess. Confess to Possess. Which means you confess with your mouth what you want over 30 days. I'll be I'll be running, I'll be posting stuff on a daily basis on the WhatsApp group. Uh, we probably might, might have a mobile app up and running as well. We're posting it in there, and then you just make those confession so that you can possess them. Listen, we cannot rise above the level of our confession. So as you go today, remember you are blessed and highly favored. Things might not be working right now, but you say what you want out of your own mouth. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for the ability to be able to understand the power of our confession on our lives. As your children go today, let them carry a consciousness that they have the power to set their lives how they want their life, their own lives to be. How? By the words of their mouth in the name of Jesus Christ. May we choose words of life, words of grace, words of uh, promotion every single day in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I know it might be challenging at times when we are crowded in with all the issues of life. But Lord, we've seen the, the examples of Jesus this morning that Jesus Christ only speaks what he wanted, regardless of what he faces. Help us to develop to that point where we can say what we want all the time and not what we are facing. Lord, I decree by faith that we are lifted up as a family. I decree by faith that lines are falling to us in pleasant places. I decree by faith that we are divinely healed of any infirmity. I decree by faith that we are prosperous and we are bound unto every good work. I decree by faith that we keep going higher and higher in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you praise and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. I just want to say to somebody, you are going through a phase. Uh, as I said um, in that message that I again ask you to go and watch on YouTube, uh, Programming Your Mind for Success, that I prayed yesterday with, the, with, with some people in church. I said something about that's very important. The world is going to, to go through a season. It is coming. It's coming. The floods are coming. But listen to me carefully. Go back and read Genesis chapter 7. God showed me a revelation there. No matter how floody, if there's such a word, that the word may be, no matter how things may look, you are prone. Because the Lord has shot you in into the ark. And the ark is who? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So don't allow your heart to be afraid or petrified. The fear that rise above it. You are rising above the limitations of life. In fact, there's going to be an exchange of wealth, an exchange of dynamics. It's about to happen. So get ready for it in the name of Jesus. Praise God forevermore. Father, I just want to thank you for everyone who's joined to church today. I thank you that as they go, Almighty God, that you are with them, you are for them, you are in them. And that this week, Lord, will see a manifestation of the goodness, kindness, blessings, and the grace of God upon their lives. No matter where they are right now, we declare that new course direction on in, in, in an upward movement is happening for them in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Hallelujah, Hallelujah! Thank you very much for listening. It's been a, it's been an honor to serve you this morning. One last thing I want to say: uh, for those of you who are joining the Love Cells, we will have the meeting tomorrow, twenty sixth of September at six o'clock. I think you see the banner on the screen. You you're gonna get um, the invite posted into the WhatsApp group that has been created for you, especially for that. And lastly. I'm just going to say, also say to you that in the, in the coming days or possibly maximum within the next one or two weeks, we will be launching our mobile app. It's going to be an awesome one. You know, as we've been waiting for a long time to launch that. So when we have the mobile app, you can watch this live stream on the mobile app. You can go back and watch the replay of, um, of the Wednesday message. On, on mobile app you can send a prayer request you can donate easily one step given you can donate there uh, you can read uh, your devotional on the on the, on the mobile app uh, you can also connect to the love cells 
you know you can connect to a love cell that you want and join the love cell and, and engage with yourself it's gonna be an awesome I mean, I mean, I've been doing. it's not a perfect mobile app but it will do its job it will help us to foster community which is something that has been on my heart for a long time so Again, be on the watch out for that. Uh, you might see the advert on the screen, but if, it, if not, just be on the watch out. We're going to be launching it one of these days in the, on, in, on a Wednesday service so that everybody in church you know, can be part of it. Thank you again for allowing me to minister to you this morning. I hope it's been a blessing to you. This season that we're going through is an awesome one for me personally, in my personal life. And I just trust that the Lord who is working in you, working in me, will cause us to glorify his name everywhere that we go. In the name of Jesus Christ, your story is about to change. God bless you. Remember, you are blessed and I'm favored. I'll be speaking to you next week. Thank you for worshiping with us. We hope you enjoyed the sermon. We were blessed to have you. We hope to see you again on Wednesday for midweek service at 6 p.m. UK time, morning prayers every Saturday at 6 a.m. UK time, and Sunday service at 8 a.m. UK time. The replay for today's service will premiere on YouTube at 10 a.m. UK time. For love offering, kindly use the bank details on your screen or you can scan the QR code on your screen to give via PayPal. We invite you to join our monthly Practicality of Grace series every first Wednesday of the month. The series features discussions with guests who take your questions and show you how to practically apply God's grace in different areas of your life. You can send your anonymous questions to the live chat on the website at www.thelighthouse.org. That is www.thelighthouse.org. Or you can send an email to lights at thelighthouse.org. Would you like us to pray with you? Kindly click the link that pops up in the live chat and fill the form or you can visit our website at www.thelighthouse.org and fill the request form. You can now book a counseling or prayer session with Pastor Davis on Calendly. Visit the link on the website or in the description box and follow the instructions to book a session. Follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and TikTok on the username that is displayed on the screen. Don't forget to comment, like, and share our messages. Until next time, remain in your identity in Christ Jesus. Nothing missing, you are everything encompassing, and that's what I will.